evening, Wednesday evening, everybody. Hope you've had a good week so far. And for those of you joining us online, would you please stand? We're going to sing a song uh, about marching to Zion. We're going to Jerusalem, and every day that we live, we're getting closer and closer to the city, right? And so this song talks about that. We're marching to Zion. Come we that love the Lord and let our joys be known. Lord, in a song with sweet accord, join in a song with sweet accord. And thus around the throne, and thus around the throne, we're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Let those refuse to sing who never knew our God. But children of the heavenly King, but children of the heavenly King may speak their joys abroad, may speak their joys abroad. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Then let our songs abound and every tear be dry. We're marching through Emmanuel's crown. We're marching through Emmanuel's ground to fairer worlds on high, to fairer worlds on high. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. All right, how many are excited about that trip, right? All right, amen. Have a seat. All right, well, whoa. good evening. And welcome to uh, those who are watching online also. Good evening to you likewise. All righty, um, if you're in the auditorium, uh, we have a new little prayer list we'll be giving out every week. It's just a little half sheet like that. And uh, we're going to go back to bulletins also. And they'll be a little smaller, just a sheet, half sheet like this also. Uh, but here's a list of uh, the folks. Now, these are the same people that are on our email list that you get every Wednesday. Um, but this is just uh, another paper for you to, to keep and to pray over for these folks. And... Uh, we did not put last names just because some people feel uh, sometimes, uh, you know, like they don't want their, their name out there. So we put the first name and then the initial, and if you uh, don't know who they are, just God knows who they are. You pray for them either way, okay? Alrighty. Well, uh, we have covered the uh, book of Judges. There's actually one last judge we're going to look at, um, not tonight, but... Uh, Next week, there's one last judge that we're going to... It's not found in the book of Judges, but he has an, a whole book written about him. So you have to come back and figure that out next week. All righty, but uh, we're going to go to the book of Ruth tonight. So the book of Ruth, Ruth is right after Judges. And uh, Ruth happen, happened during the time of the Judges. But, uh, you know, she has her own little book. Uh, you know, the last couple of weeks, we looked at a couple of really strange, tragic, horrific stories, as I described in there, PG-13. Um, you know, last week, we, we saw a Levite that uh, his concubine was abused and by some men, and so he cut her up and sent her out to 12 different tribes, 12 different areas there. Um, and, and, you know, there were some other uh, strange stories. Unless you think that, you know, the book of, of Judges is just about a bunch of strange stories with bad endings. Um, there's the story of Ruth, and it's a, it's a great story. And it would have happened probably during the time of Gideon. Uh, so if you can kind of go back to, in your mind, when 
as we, we uh, looked at uh, Gideon, if you remember, Gideon had an uh, <coughs> issue with the, with the Midianites uh, coming down every year, and they would uh, take the crops that the people had worked hard at cultivating. And this happened for seven years, and God finally raised up Gideon. And we know the story of Gideon, don't we? We hope you, you remember that one. But uh, Gideon took his um, 300 men after he started with, um, you know, of course, a lot more than that. He as, as, uh, started with 32,000 and whittled down to 300, and he took on 135,000 Midianites, and God provided the victory. So during this time span would have been uh, probably the time of Ruth because there was a famine in the land, and uh, because of the, the, uh, the, the nation of uh, the Midianites uh, stripping the land and taking the, the resources, it left the people in very dire straits. So uh, Ruth and her family... Uh, I'm sorry, Naomi is the uh, is who's, who who we're going to start off with, um, and her family are going to uh, go down and uh, travel to Moab. So we're going to look at the story tonight, and it's a story of a, a famine. It's a story in which uh, people had to move. It's a story of family members dying. It's a story of people being sad and depressed. It's a story about loyalty. It's a story about redemption. It's a story about, uh, you know, uh, uh, faith, love, marriage. You know, a lot of good things happen in the book of Ruth. And uh, I can tell you that uh, there's a happy ending. So I like stories with a happy ending. Of course, the Bible has a happy ending, but you have to go through a lot of bad things before you get to the happy ending. So we're going to look at this, the story of Ruth tonight. And uh, let's pray first, and we'll get into the story. Father, thank you tonight for the time to share the word and to... Just look at this great story that uh, is right after the book of Judges we just covered, and I just pray that we would understand uh, what the whole story meant and, and how it affects us and, and how it is a beautiful picture of you, Lord. I pray your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we look at uh, the story of Ruth tonight, our theme is God blesses those who are faithful to Him, and our title of our message tonight is faithful to a faithful God. Faithful to a faithful God. Uh, let's start with uh, Ruth chapter 1, verse 1. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. Well, famine strikes the land, and it causes people now to have to leave the land. Um, back in the 1930s in our country, there was a, uh, a very uh, bad drought that hit the, the Midwest. Um, the Dust Bowl, maybe you've seen pictures of the Dust Bowl or videos of it in which just big storms uh, blow through and, and virtually destroyed millions and millions of acres of, of crops and left farms devastated, and uh, there were some farmers that just picked up and left, and they moved to a different area, moved to an industrial area, and quit farming, and left their land, and got new jobs, and moved to a different area. And this is kind of what happens to uh, Ruth, uh, I'm sorry, Naomi, and her family, as we see that, um, uh, that uh, we're going to see Ruth's life first off in Moab, is our first point, and under that is desperate circumstances. So the desperate circumstances are that you have a family uh, that is from Bethlehem, Judah. Of course, that is the hometown of David, and eventually would become the hometown in which Jesus, not he wasn't, actually didn't live, live there, but he was born there in Bethlehem, Bethlehem of Judah. Uh, so you have a, um, a husband, a wife, and their two boys, Verse 2 identifies the names of these people. It says the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife Naomi, and the name of his two sons Malan and Chilion, uh, Ephratites of Benjamin, uh, I'm sorry, of Bethlehem, Judah. And they came into the country of Moab and continued there. So, you know, you have to go somewhere if there's no food or there's no, uh, you know, you have to take care of your family. Now, if you are kind of wondering where Moab is, Here's kind of a picture of Israel. Uh, you have the Mediterranean Sea, as I'm looking at it, like you'd be looking at it. Uh, the Mediterranean Sea is to the west 
of Israel. The Jordan River is to the east of, 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 of that uh, body of water. And in between the uh, Mediterranean Sea and the Jordan River is the land of Israel. On the other side of the Jordan River, uh, in the southern region, way down like below near where the Dead Sea is, so you have the Jordan River, Sea of Galilee up top here, the Sea of Galilee empties into the Jordan River, the Jordan River then empties into the Dead Sea. So the very south part of Israel, the Dead Sea, it's very hot, dry, arid, uh, and, and of course you have that um, uh, the Dead Sea and the, the Jordan River is kind of a barrier between a country, modern day country is Jordan on the other side. Well, in Jordan, modern day Jordan, uh, there, were, there were a number of, of uh, tribes that lived there and one of the tribes that lived there was the, the, uh, or the you know, people groups were the Moabites. And so they would have to travel on the other side of the Dead Sea, on the other side of the Jordan River and uh, you know, from Bethlehem and uh, so they had to travel south and then uh, across where they went uh, around the Dead Sea or over the, you know, before it started in Jordan, we're not sure. But uh, they would have traveled, it's, a bit, it's about a 50 mile journey. And as they traveled there, they knew that here's a, an area where we can get food, we can provide for our family. Now they were just going to sojourn in verse number one. The word sojourn means just take a trip it's not a permanent trip, but it's just a temporary time to be away. And so they were planning to sojourn maybe a year, maybe several years. But we see now that 10 years are going to come by, go by, and, and there, there are some terrible things happen while they are in Moab. And so you have uh, Naomi, you have Elimelech, her husband, you have their two sons, Malan and Chilion. And then they moved to Moab. Now, verse number three says this, And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. So she becomes a widow. Must have been a very, um, you know, tough, unnerving situation. She's in a foreign country. She's now without her husband. She has two boys only. And uh, then it says how that, uh, verse number four, And they took them wives of the women of Moab. Now, they couldn't marry Israelite women because they didn't live in Israel. So they're of marrying age, and so they choose Moabite women. Now, a Moabite woman would have come from a pagan background. She would have not been, um, you know, somebody that followed God, followed Jehovah God. They would have been uh, pagans. Uh, sometimes the Moabites worshipped the god Shemosh, which is very, um, you know, of course, uh, idolatry uh, to, to worship another god instead of God. But that's probably all they knew. That's probably all they were exposed to. And so understand that the two boys took on two women that did not have the same faith that they had. Uh, so it, it would be, in our terminology or in our you know, modern day Christianity, it would be a, as though a, a Christian young man uh, married a woman from a completely different faith. So... Uh, as the story continues in verse number five, and Malan and Chilion died, also both of them, and the woman was left of her two sons uh, uh, and, and her husband. So this is a rare situation when uh, two boys would die likewise. Usually children outlast their parents, and to have the death of one son would have been tragic enough, but to have the death of both sons is devastating. So here is Naomi. She left Bethlehem with a husband and two sons. She loses her husband. Her two sons marry pagan women, and then her two sons die. And I'm sure that, uh, you know, this, this was now, a, uh, as we mentioned in our point, it's a, it's a desperate circumstance. She's all alone now. She's all by herself. So she's a widow. All she has left are the two daughter-in-laws. And, um, it says that, uh, um, uh, that uh, they had died. Uh, in verse number four, it says that uh, they dwell there about, uh, I'm sorry, I skipped verse four. So let's go back and uh, let's read that. It says, and they took them wives of the women of Moab. The names of the one was Orpah and the name of the other Ruth. So now we're introduced to Ruth and they dwell there about 10 years. So this is a 10 year sojourn. Orpah and Ruth are the two women, the two pagan, unsaved women that Malan and Chilion uh, marry. And so we're introduced to Ruth. 
So Ruth was a Moabite woman. She would not have grown up in a, in a home that worshipped Jehovah. She would have grown up in a pagan home. And uh, so now um, she has to make some decisions. Naomi has to make some decisions. That's the second thing we're going to look at. Uh, decisive choices. What am I going to do? Am I going to stay here in a foreign land with two daughters-in-laws, or should I go back home to Bethlehem? So uh, we see how that she decides she needs to head back. In verse number six, then she rose with her daughters-in-law uh, that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people and giving them bread. So now the famine was over. The Israelites were eating again bread, and you know there was no longer this uh, desperate situation in, in Israel. And so why stay in Moab? Go back to your hometown. Go back to your people. Go back to the, the land that you grew up in and instead of staying in, in Moab. What, what did Moab have to offer her? She, you know, she lost her husband there. She lost her two sons there. And uh, so she, now she has to make a decision about returning home. But, you know, she has uh, her two daughters-in-laws. And what are they going to do? They've lost their husbands likewise. So you really have three widows in this story. And, uh, but... Uh, uh, the advantage that uh, Orpah and Ruth had is they were young women, uh, I guess. I'm not sure how young they would have been, but they were probably in their 30s. And, you know, if they had been married in their 20s and then I had about 10 years of, uh, of before the, the, the two boys died, they would have probably been in their 30s. They were still uh, in, in, you know, the age bracket where they could get married again. And so uh, uh, as we see the story unfold, she, uh, she arises, and verse number seven, and verse uh, says, Wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return into the land of Judah. And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go return each uh, to her mother's house, and the Lord deal kindly with you, as he had dealt with the dead and with me. In essence, they started traveling, then she decided why why should I bring my two daughters-in-law? You know, they need to just go back home. They should go back to their, their mother's home, and it's there that they can carry on their life. And uh, so she implores both of them to leave and to go back. And uh, verse number 9, And the Lord grant you that you may rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. Now, understand that they had been through some very uh, terrible, sorrowful times. Uh, you know, when Malin and Chilean died, Ruth and, and Orpah both lost their husbands, and I'm sure it was a very close-knit family, and they all felt the pain of the brothers dying. They felt the pain, of course, of the, of, that Naomi had, and that she was a widow. And so here's the three women that are very close, and they're brought together not only because they're family, but they're brought together because of tragedy. You know, sometimes the closest we are to people are not in the good times, but in the bad times. Sometimes we grow close to people because we have a common sorrow or common tragedy or common death that, uh, that brings people close together. And so this was the situation that as they, uh, they wept together, and uh, she says, now go back, in essence, and go find husbands again, get married, carry on with your life. And at first, both of them didn't want to do that. In verse number 10, and they said unto her, surely we will return with thee unto thy people. And Naomi uh, said, and she kind of uh, says something that's kind of a little, uh, little bit funny, a little bit of a sarcasm here. And Naomi said, uh, turn again, my daughters. Why will ye go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb uh, that uh, may be your husbands? Turn again, my daughters. Go your way, for I'm too old uh, uh, to have a husband, if I should say I have hope. If I should have a husband also tonight and should bear sons, would you tarry for them till they were grown? Would uh, you stay for them from having husbands? Nay, nay, daughters, my daughters, uh, for it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. And so understand what she says. I don't have any more kids to, to, to bring forth. I, I'm too old. And even if I got married tonight and had, uh, had children, uh, you know, with pretty soon after get, being married again, would you wait till they grew up? Would you wait 20 years, in essence, for them to grow up again? And, and so, you know, the message was, I have nothing to offer you. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not going to bring forth any more sons. Uh, you know, go home, 
Find yourself, and that's, that's, that's a reasonable thing to tell the daughters-in-law, isn't it? Uh, there's no sense dragging them to Israel. There's no sense them going there and, you know, uh, hoping and waiting, you know, something would happen there. And so now these, these uh, two daughters-in-law, they have to make a decision. What are we going to do with our lives? Are we going to stay loyal to our mother-in-law and travel with her? Or are we going to go back and, to our own mothers and find, a, uh, you know, happiness with another husband? And so um, we kind of have a split decision. Uh, you know, the, the, the two daughter-in-laws differed on what they want to do. And by the way, uh, there's no right and wrong in a situation. Uh, to go back is fine. Or to stick with, Ruth, with Naomi would have been fine likewise. It's just a matter of choice. But uh, as we see now, uh, you have two women, and uh, one is going to return, and one is going to stay. As the, uh, we see the story in verse number 15, it says, uh, or 14, and they lifted up their voice, their voice and wept again. And, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. Evidently, Ruth was closer to Naomi than Orpah. Uh, she couldn't bear the thought of leaving her. She'd actually like, become a mother. You know, sometimes uh, in this particular case, uh, she was closer probably to her mother-in-law than she was to her very own mother. Um, and, uh, you know, there are times in which, uh, you know, there's, there's a close relationship to, a, to an in-law or to a, a mother or father. Become, mother or father-in-law becomes like your own personal mother or father. And this is uh, what she, wa- she wanted to, to stay with Naomi. She didn't want her to leave. Now, it could be that she felt terrible for Naomi. It could be she didn't want her to go back by herself. But I think she just had this genuine love for her mother-in-law and it, she just wanted to be with her, and she wanted to, uh, you know, to, to go wherever she would go. So they had, a, they had a decision to make, and they made two separate decisions. So um, uh, verse number 15, and, and she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law has gone back uh, unto her people and unto her gods. Notice, unto her people and unto her gods. Plural. So they were a pagan society. And even though... Uh, Naomi was, uh, you know, from Israel and, and worshipped uh, the Jewish faith. The two daughter-in-laws evidently held on to their paganistic practices because she said, "Go back to your mother, <coughs> like your, you know, like your other sister-in-law did, and to their gods." So they worshipped a number of gods, and uh, return thou after thy sister-in-law. And verse 16, and Ruth said, entreat me not to leave thee or return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and whither thou lodgest, I will lodge. And thy people shall be thy, my people, and my, thy God shall be my God. Now, this is the key verse of Ruth. Ruth makes a tremendous statement here where she uh, begs Naomi not to tell her to keep going back home. And notice what she said, because she's going to have to travel from her country now to a different country. Naomi had traveled from Israel to Moab. Now, Ruth would have to travel from Moab to Israel. She would have to go to a land she never was in. (coughs) She would probably have to learn a language that she did not know. She would have to learn a people, uh, you know, be involved in a people, society, or culture that she was not familiar with. And so she makes a proclamation here that wherever you go, I go. I'm going to with. I'm going to. I'm staying with you. So the bond, the love. This is a precious story because it shows the depth of love. That she was willing to leave her land. She was willing to leave her family. She was willing to leave really her religious upbringing, and everything was going to change. And it changed because of her love for her mother-in-law. And it tells you something about Naomi. Naomi was a was a you know, probably a godly woman, a great example, probably a woman of compassion, uh, a woman that she looked up to, she revered, she respected, maybe she wanted to be like her, a woman that was strong, maybe in the midst of losing her husband, losing her sons. And so she is someone that, um, that Ruth just idolizes to the point where she says that I'm going to go where you go, Wherever you lodge, wherever you stay, I'm going to stay there. And your people, the Israelites, are now going to be my people. I'm no, no longer going to be considered a Moabite. I'm going to go and, 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 and allow your people to become my people now. Sometimes people go to another country, 
and they don't really get immersed into that culture. They don't really, you know, become part of that people group. They're still kind of outsiders. But this is not what Ruth was all about. And then finally, she said, my, thy God shall be my God. Ruth had an upbringing of, of paganism. She had not worshipped Jehovah God. And so she has a conversion here. And it shows you the power of, of, of the witness and the testimony of the type of person that Naomi was. You know, so it's kind of interesting when we try to share the gospel with people. And, uh, you know, sometimes people evaluate the gospel based on us. And, you know, they see what kind of person you are. And if you're a mean, nasty uh, disrespectful and, you know, type of person that people don't want to be around, and then you start preaching about Jesus to people, you know, they think, well, you have, you know, Jesus definitely didn't do anything for you. You know, I don't see anything good about you, so why should I follow what your belief system is? But on the other hand, when you see somebody has displays of fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, kindness, meekness, faith, uh, all these wonderful things that, that flow out of your life, that people see that in you. And sometimes that's what attracts them to the gospel. Yes, they hear about Christ. Yes, they hear about uh, how that he died for our sins. But you know, people today can't see Jesus. All they can see is Jesus through you. People can't see you are fa can't, can't see the God that you're talking about, but when you display God-like characteristics, they get a little vision of what God is all about. So maybe our most effective way of reaching people beyond just preaching to them and talking to them all the time is to be more like Christ, to have a type of testimony and a walk with the Lord that attracts people, that they want what you have. They want the joy you have, the peace that you have. The, uh, you know, maybe she watched as her mother-in-law went through the tragedy of losing her husband and her two sons, and yet she was still, didn't curse God. <coughs> you know, <coughs> sometimes people in the midst of suffering and pain, they blame God. It's God's fault. Why didn't God, why did God take away my family? Why did God take away my husband? Why did God take away my boys? And sometimes in the midst of tragedy, people become bitter. And, you know, so now, who wants to be involved in a faith or religion that they can't get you through hard times? And so I think Naomi showed that no matter what happens, that her God is good and her God is faithful. And it, uh, her testimony was one of, of such a, a radiance of, of the grace of God that it enabled her daughter-in-law, Ruth, to want to follow her and be with her and even take on the same God that she had. And so in order for her to do that, she, she had a complete conversion. Uh, you, you know, and this is no small task. This would be like, a, a, for example, if a Jewish person all of a sudden says, you know, I, I, want, I want Jesus to be my God. You know, that's a pretty big step for a Jewish person to accept Jesus as Messiah because they've been taught from a youth that Jesus is not really the Messiah. He's just a, a prophet. And, of course, if they were honest they would have to admit, like their forefathers said, that Jesus was a false prophet. But, you know, sometimes they don't want to offend Christians, and so they'll just say, well, we don't accept him as, as Messiah. But yet it was their forefathers that put Jesus on the cross and crucified him. Uh, it would be like if a, if, if a Muslim, uh, you know, would now say, well, you know, I, I'm going to forsake the teachings of Muhammad and the Quran, and, and I am going to embrace Christianity, It'd be like somebody who was an atheist that says, I, I don't have any faith, but I see Christ in you, and I'm going I'm to give my heart and life to Jesus. And so it was, a, it was a, a tremendous, tremendous conversion. Anytime pagans, somebody that worshiped false gods, plural, rejected all those gods. Now, it could have been that she worshiped, as I mentioned earlier, the god Shemosh. Shemosh was uh, a god, in order to appease the god of Shemosh, the Moabites at times would sacrifice their own children. If you ever read in the Bible where it talks about how that, that uh, some of these pagan cultures passed their children through the fire 
That's a term in which means that they literally sacrificed their children and burned their children up to appease their gods. So maybe uh, she saw that as uh, in, inhumane, and, and if, if that's what it takes to please our God, is that the type of God that I want to worship? So she trusted the God of Israel, and she is wonderfully and, uh, and gloriously saved. And so uh, now... Um, She's going to join Naomi in her trek back to Israel. Now realize she's in Moab, so she has to take the journey. Moab was in a mountainous area, and they would have to go down the mountains of Moab to the basin of the Dead Sea area, the hot and dry desert area. If you've ever been to Israel, it's always the, the hottest, it's the lowest uh, point in the sea, sea level in the, in the entire world, 1,300 uh, 1,300 feet below sea level. <clears throat> and, um, and, and so uh, they would have to travel across that, that dry desert land. And then they would have to go up the Judean hills, Judean mountains, as they trekked up towards Jerusalem and Bethlehem. Bethlehem is just outside of Jerusalem. And uh, it would have been, as we mentioned before, about a 50-mile tra- uh, trip. But it was a hard 50 miles. And, you know, on foot probably. But they returned to the little town of Bethlehem. Now, the significance here we're going to see is that uh, Bethlehem is going to play a role in this whole thing, as we're going to see later on. So as uh, the, uh, verse 17, uh, where thou diest, she continues, I will die, uh, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. And uh, so, um, verse 18, when she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. So they traveled to Bethlehem, and uh, it's there that they uh, enter into the city. Notice what happens when they get into the city in verse number 19. It says, And it came to pass, when they were come to Bethlehem, that all the city was moved unto them. And they said, Is this Naomi? Is this? Now, they hadn't seen Naomi for how many years? Ten years. And those were ten hard years. In those ten years, she'd lost her husband. In those ten years, she'd lost her two sons. You know, when you go through tragedy, tragedy like that, sometimes it ages you. And I'm not saying anybody that has a child that dies or a husband dies, all of a sudden they look old, but it aged her. And, uh, and you know, people are wondering, is that, is that Naomi? You know, she, she, looks, she doesn't look like she looked ten years ago when she left here. I'm sure her countenance was different. I'm sure she didn't have that radiance maybe that she had before. And so they, they want to know, is that her? Now notice what she says, verse 20, and she said unto them, call me not Naomi. Now the word Naomi means pleasant because she didn't feel pleasant anymore. She didn't feel, you know, anymore that, that she, was, she had a pleasant life. Her life had fallen apart. Her husband's dead. Her two sons are dead. She lived in a foreign land for 10 years. She's coming back with a daughter-in-law. Don't call me Naomi anymore. Don't call me Pleasant, but instead call me another name. Call me Mara. And uh, for the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. Now, the word Mara means bitter. And in this phrase here, it says, where the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. Now, I'm not saying, she's not saying that God... uh, treated her, her mean or, or, or treated her, uh, you know, in, in, in a bitter way. But I think what she's saying is that God has allowed things to happen that has, has, has turned my, my spirit. And, 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 you know, somebody that's, that's lost people like this and somebody that is uh, coming back now to their hometown, uh, totally different than how, she, how they left, uh, I think it's an indication also that uh, she, uh, she realized that God allowed things to happen to her, and he had dealt with me bitterly. Not blaming God, but God had dealt with her bitterly. And so she, uh, she wants to be called a different name now. I think at this point, Naomi is probably not the most enjoyable person. I think at this point, her, her attitude was probably uh, one in which somebody who has suffered a lot, someone who had been in the depths of despair, and once again, you know, probably previous to the death of, of all her, you know, of, of her kids, of her sons, 
I'm sure she was a very pleasant person. As I mentioned before, I think that's probably what attracted Ruth to her. But I think Ruth probably felt compelled, like, I have to help my mother-in-law out, and I have to be there for her, and I have to, you know, help her for the rest of her days, and I want to stay connected to her. So uh, we see then this uh, desperate situation. Now, number two, let's look at Ruth's life in the promised land. Uh, Now, what are you going to do? You go back to Bethlehem. What do you do for food? What do you do for a job? You've been out of that country for 10 years. You've, uh, you know, you had a little land, you had a piece of property. And, you know, according to the law, no one could take that land away from you. It had to stay within your family. But uh, uh, as they go back now, uh, you know, her husband's dead. Her two sons are dead. And so what's happened now, uh, whenever someone had a piece of property, would go down to the firstborn son, and then if he died, it would go to the secondborn son. But there are no sons left. There's just Naomi. There's a piece of property that would have had belonged to her, but now she really doesn't have the rights to it because her husband's dead and her two sons are dead. So she's going back now, and and, um, we're going to see how now that Ruth is going to be very resourceful. So let's see the resourcefulness of Ruth, chapter number 2 and verse number 1. Chapter 2, verse 1. And Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth, of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. Now we're introduced to another character in the story. His name is Boaz. Boaz is a kinsman. A kinsman means a relative. Uh, So this is a relative of her husband's, and uh, a very rich man, and he owns property, and he has great wealth, and his name is Boaz. And verse number two, And Ruth the Moabitess said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him, in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. Now, it made sense that they were going to go to, to Boaz's field because he was a relative. And a relative would be more apt to allow you to glean, which brings us up to the subject of gleaning. What does it mean to glean? Well, to glean simply means that as a means of taking care of poor people in biblical times, if you had a field, <coughs> you were, had your workers go out to that field, and uh, you would have certain boundaries in which they would harvest your crops. And, but then uh, they usually went maybe like in a, in a circular fashion, but the corners of the property, they did not harvest. They left that for the poor people. And the poor people would go to the edges of the field, and it would be there that they would be allowed to, to take the food for free. This was God's way of, of uh, you know, taking care of the poor people. They didn't have... Uh, Uh, Social Security, they didn't have welfare like we have today, in which our government takes care of poor people. But God still wanted to take care of his people and poor people, and so that was the way that they did it. And they could go to those fields, and it was perfectly okay to take the food from certain areas of that field, knowing that, you you know, your field is helping provide food for poor people. So, once again, it was called gleaning. There was another aspect of gleaning that... As you went, your servants went and harvested the field, and they put the food in baskets, that if the baskets became too filled up, and they would start to overflow, and some of the grain would fall to the ground, you didn't pick the grain back up again, you let it stay. And that was also an area in which people could go to, where there was just an, an, after the the harvest, and there was just an excess of, uh, of crops, and they couldn't carry it anymore back in their baskets, then they could go and take that grain also. So gleaning was a way in which the poor people uh, could have food. And so she suggests, let's go to Boaz's field. He's related to your husband, and that would be a good place to to, to glean. And so uh, God is now in control, and uh, uh, she now, it says... uh, uh, she suggests to go there in verse number three. And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And her hap was to light on the part of the field belonging unto Boaz, who was of the kindred of Elimelech. Well, 
as she's gleaning in Boaz's field, Boaz notices her, and Ruth, I'm sure, was a very attractive woman, and Boaz being an, an, uh, an older gentleman, unmarried, uh, you know, he sees this attractive uh, woman in his field gleaning, so he inquires to find out who is this woman that's gleaning in the field. And uh, verse number four, and behold, Boaz came <coughs> excuse me, from Bethlehem and said unto his reapers, the Lord be with thee. And uh, they answered him, the Lord bless him. It's a good way to, to, uh, to greet your workers. The Lord bless you and to bless you also is a spiritual man. And uh, verse 5, then said Boaz unto his servants uh, that was set over the reapers, uh, whose damsel is this? And the servants uh, that set over the reapers answered, it is the Moabitish damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. And uh, she said, I pray you let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and hath continued even from uh, morning unto now that she tarried a little in the house. So uh, she was a hard worker. They said she's been here all day. She came here early in the morning, and she's still here at night, and she took a very little time to, to take a break. <clears throat> and so <clears throat> we see that she's, she's a hard worker, industrial, industrious, and, um, you know, this catches the attention of, of Boaz also. She's not lazy, certainly, and she's trying to take, get the food to take care of her and her mother-in-law. She has a, a love for her mother-in-law and wants to take care of of her also. So anyhow, in, um, as uh, we see now, Boaz takes an interest in her and he begins now to afford some privileges for her. For example, in uh, verse number eight, uh, he, she, uh, she was instructed, Boaz says, tell her to stay in my fields. Make sure she doesn't go in anybody else's fields. I want to take care of her. She's going to stay in my fields. In verse number nine, uh, in order to protect her from potentially other men coming and harassing her or abusing her or whatever else because she was a single woman now, unprotected. Uh, he ordered that his men uh, not take advantage of her and that, uh, that she be protected while she was in the field. In verse 9 also, he uh, brought forth a drink and made sure that she had uh, something to drink all the time. And then uh, she, uh, the uh, verse number 14, the portion of food, Knowing that uh, she was hard, uh, hard working, she um, uh, she was invited to eat with uh, the the servants. So he's he's you know he's interested in her. So he's doing all these nice things for her, uh, so that uh, you know hopefully uh, things may work out in the long run. Well, we go down to verse number fifteen, and it says, "And when she had risen up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying." Uh, let her glean even among the sheaves and reproach her not. Now, he says, I want her, she can go beyond the designated areas in which glean is and let her come into the fields where they're bringing in the sheaves. You know, the old gospel song, bringing in the sheaves, it's a, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're bringing in the harvest. And he's let her, let her go into the harvest area there. Uh, and so now she's going beyond what the gleaners would do. And he says, uh, reproach her not. In verse number 16, uh, and let fall also some of the handfuls of purpose for her and leave them that she may glean them and rebuke or not. Now he says, on purpose, I want you to spill over your baskets, some of your baskets on purpose, you know? And uh, so what's he doing? He's providing extra food for her. He's making sure that she gathers much. And uh, so we see him uh, doing this. And so now she went out and <clears throat> gleaned in the field unto evening, and, and uh, uh, she went up in verse 18. She, she took it up and went up into the city, and her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned, and she brought forth and gave to her what she uh, had reserved after she had sufficed. And her mother-in-law said unto her, where, where hast thou gleaned today? How'd you come back with all this food? I, you know, she probably never seen somebody come back with the amount of food that Ruth came back with. And so she explained to her how that uh, she'd gone into the field of Boaz and how that he had, he had taken care of her and blessed uh, what she had done. And so uh, Naomi understands now what's going on. She understands that, uh, you know, that uh, there is a potential that uh, Boaz uh, and, and Ruth may, may come together and, and uh, she's going to kind of be a little matchmaker here and, and suggest that, uh, what she needed to do. 
So uh, as we see <clears throat> her story, the story now, um, the romance continues. Look at, uh, <clears throat> look at verse, uh, uh, let me see where I'm at. Uh, verse number, uh, uh, let's go into, into, into chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 1. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said unto her, uh, My daughter, shall I not seek rest for thee, that it may be well with thee? And now uh, is not Boaz of our kindred, with whose maidens thou was. Behold, he winnoweth barley tonight in the threshing floor. Wash thyself therefore, and anoint thee, and put thy garment down, uh, put, thy, put thy raiment upon thee, and get thee down to the floor, but make not thyself known unto the man until he shall have done eating and drinking. And it shall be when he lieth down that thou shalt mark the place where he shall lie, and thou shalt go in and cover his feet and lay thee down, and he will tell thee what thou uh, shalt do. And she said unto her, All that thou sayest unto me, I will do. Now here's a game plan. <clears throat> Naomi knows that uh, Boaz is interested in Ruth. Boaz is a relative of her husband. And according to Old Testament law, Boaz potentially could... Uh, be the one who purchases or buys back the property that had belonged to uh, Elimelech, her father-in-law, and to Naomi, uh, her mother-in-law, and to Malan and Chilean. And so this, uh, this property had kind of gone into like a, a bankruptcy or a receivership type of situation. And uh, so therefore, uh, you know, whoever owned it, if a kinsman had the right, he could purchase the property back so that the property stayed within the family's name. You could not, <clears throat> you know, you couldn't trade property or sell property and move, you know, like we do, you know, if you live in a house and you want to move to a different town, you can do that, and there's no laws that say you can't do that. But in the times of Israel, the land that was given unto you remained in your family. You didn't sell it, you didn't trade it, uh, you didn't move away. Now, of course, they moved away to Moab, but it was a sojourn, meaning that we're going to come back. And so now uh, she understands that if Naomi, if Ruth and Boaz could get married, Boaz could be a kinsman redeemer, meaning that he would have the right to purchase the land that already had belonged to them at one time before they moved to Moab that, uh, so that it would stay in the family. And so the game plan was this. He, she said, uh, he's going to be threshing weed, and, and after that, they're going to be, um, you know, they're going to have a dinner, they're going to eat, they're going to drink. He's going to go to bed, and I want you to, to mark where he's at, and then you are going to go in at night, you're going to uncover his feet, and you're going to lay over top of his feet. Now, that sounds kind of weird to us, doesn't it? You know, like, what's that all about? Is that, you know, is that a PG-13 thing? You know, is that... Is that, uh, you know, she's making some advancement upon him? And, and, and it's not. It's nothing like that. And what it is, is uh, this was a, a, a method or a, a, a symbol in which uh, she was expressing a desire that he would marry her. He would marry her. So she's not making some sort of sexual advancement to him, but she is... Uh, you know, the uncovering the feet was just a symbol uh, to lay down his feet. She was identifying that she was available if he would marry her and that, that uh, you know, because of, of being a, a close, a kinsman, you know, that, she, that he was, you know, from, from their family. So it's kind of, you know, it's, it's kind of strange. But anyhow, uh, look at verse, uh, so she does that. So she, she goes out and Boaz is now eating and he's drunken. He's not drunk, but he eats and, and drinks. And then uh, she went in and she uncovered his feet and she laid down. And verse number eight, and it came to pass at midnight, that the man was afraid and turned himself and behold, a woman lay his feet. He's wondering, <laughs> you know, he's asleep when she came in and now he turns over. What's this woman laying on my feet? Didn't understand what was going on. Verse number nine, he said, who art thou? And she answered, I'm Ruth, thy handmaiden. Uh, spread therefore thy skirt over thine handmaiden, for thou art a near kinsman. Now, what does this mean? Spread your skirt over me. 
And this comes from, uh, once again, the Old Testament law, that uh, this simply meant that, uh, uh, that uh, protect me, in essence, uh, you know, would you marry me? She, it's, it's kind of a proposal is what it is. And uh, if, you know, she would, uh, he would become her protector, meaning he, that he would cover her. He would be her covering. And so it symbolized that, you know, to, to put the skirt or the, you know, his garment over her was a symbol that he would, he would be her protector. He would cover her. He would, he would, in essence, marry her. So it's a strange proposal, I know. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's an odd way of doing things. But... Um, you know, in our day, someone, the guy usually buys a ring and he uh, finds a romantic time and he kneels down before his, you know, hopefully wife-to-be and proposes to her and she, oh, yes, thank you, you know. And, you know, and they, 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 they get married and they live happily ever after. But they do things a little bit different here. And, uh, you know, as, uh, uh, as it was the law, if, uh, if you had family members that, you know, for example, if, if a brother... If a man had a brother and this man died and his brother was unmarried, his brother would have the first right to marry the widow. That's why if you remember when, when Jesus was asked a question, what happens if, a, if there's seven brothers, they all die, and a woman married all seven, you know, one after the next, after the next, after the next. So when they got to heaven, who's going to be her husband? And it's kind of a complicated situation. Jesus said, none of them, you know, it's, that's not what heaven's all about it. And, uh, and so this was a situation here that, that, that Boaz was eligible to marry her to keep within the law that, you know, she's a widow now. So here's the story, though. So he, uh, he indicates his willingness to marry Ruth uh, by performing the, the deed of, of just, you know, placing his garment or whatever over her. And uh, so um, he's, he's, he's honored and flattered that she would want to marry him also because he's an older man. And, and so, but there's a problem. And verse number 11, he says, uh, And now, my daughter, fear not, I will do to thee all that thou request, for all the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman. And uh, now it is true that I am thy near kinsman, howbeit there is a kinsman nearer than I. So there was somebody else that was, that was closer to Elimelech, and he would actually be the one that would have the first right to, you know, to, to marry uh, Ruth. Now, in marrying her, you would have to pay for her field, pay the redemption of whatever the field had gone into, some receivership, whoever owned it at that time. And uh, so he says, I, I need to find out first if, uh, if this man is interested. And so um, uh, he does some investigating, and he meets with this man that uh, uh, is the nearer kinsman. And it's there... Uh, and, and we go into uh, uh, chapter number three. We see redemption <clears throat> uh, under that redemption through Boaz. In chapter number four, so he goes down and, and he takes 10 men with him and he sits down with the, the other kinsman, the other relative, his relative, that was closer to Elimelech than what he was. Because this man would have the first rights to marry Ruth and then in marrying Ruth, he of course would, would, could, could uh, inherit that property also and pay whatever it was. And so he meets with this, this man, and he wants to know if he's interested in, uh, in, in, this, in taking on Ruth and, and the land. And uh, the man uh, basically says that uh, he, he cannot afford marrying Ruth. He cannot afford uh, her marrying her, and then if he got married and they had a child, it would mess up uh, things for his, his son and his, his inheritance. And so he chooses to decline the offer so now, because he declined, and then what they would do is, uh, uh, in, verse, in, in verse number seven, they had to symbolize that. Uh, it says, now, now this was the uh, manner in former time in Israel concerning redeeming, concerning changing, for to confirm all things, a man plucked off his shoe and gave it to his neighbor, and this was a testimony of Israel. So, once again, another odd thing. So, they would come together, and, and, and to prove that I do not want to take this property, and you can have Ruth. And the guy had to take off his shoe, <laughs> and, and uh, the right shoe, uh, and, and he, had to, he had to put the, the foot upon the land. And um, 
So the act of taking off his shoe was a symbol that he was now ceding his rights of possession, meaning that uh, I, I do not choose to take this land. So he had to take off his, his shoe, symbolizing that, and um, it was a done deal, you know. So anyhow, uh, once again, these are just customs that they did, but uh, it was important for them to, to keep their customs. So uh, now this gives uh, Boaz an opportunity to marry Ruth and uh, to purchase the field. And so now before all the elders, verse number nine, Moaz said, said unto all the elders and to all the people, you are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Chileans and Malians of the land of Noamic. No, no, uh, of, 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 uh, uh, no, uh, <laughs> anyhow, uh, let me move on. I'm getting tongue, 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 tongue tried here. Anyhow, uh, verse number 10. Moreover, Ruth the, the Moabite is the wife of Malan. Uh, have I purchased to be my wife? So he pays for the property. He pays for her to become his wife. And they get married. And uh, so now we see the last part is uh, redemption through her descendants. So now as they get married... <clears throat> Uh, God works out this, this, this beautiful relationship. And, you know, God took a tragedy and turned it around for good. Naomi now uh, is, is pleased that, you know, her daughter-in-law has married, uh, you know, uh, Boaz. And uh, so now uh, Naomi in verse number 14, and the women said uh, un, uh, unto Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, which hath not left thee this day without a kinsman, uh, that his name may be famous in Israel. And he shall be unto thee a restorer of thy life and a nourisher of thine old age. For thy daughter-in-law, which loveth thee, which is better to thee than seven sons hath borne him. And so the women are praising Naomi. And uh, I, I love this, the, the verse there where it says that he shall be unto thee a restorer of thy life. Remember she came back, she was bitter. Don't call me Naomi anymore. That means pleasant. I'm bitter. Call me Mara. But now, what's God, what God has done is that he has restored her. In her old age, she's happy again. She's encouraged again. She's lived up. Now, she's not going to get married again. She's not going to have children again. But yet, she can, through the life of her daughter-in-law now, uh, see God do a wonderful work. And so, she brings forth a child now. Naomi took the child and laid it into her bosom and began to nurse into it. And the women, um, you know, uh, uh, of her neighborhood uh, gave it a name saying, there is a son born to Naomi. Of course, it was Naomi's son, but Naomi was the, the grandmother. And they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. So her son, uh, Ruth's son's name was Obed. Obed grew up. He had a son named Jesse, so Jesse would be her grandson. And then Jesse had, remember, had eight sons. One of them was David. So that would make Ruth the great-grandmother of David. David was born in Bethlehem. David becomes the king of Israel. Uh, Jesus is now going to come through the lineage of David. So Jesus came through the lineage of a Moabite woman by the name of Ruth. And so did Jesus have some Gentile blood in him? Yeah, he did. He was not, you know, he wasn't 100% Jewish uh, because, uh, you know, his, his, uh, we see here now that the uh, great-grandmother of King David was a Moabite woman. And uh, what a beautiful story then, redemption through her descendants. This is a picture then, of course, of, of God's redeeming love. Naomi was bitter. Naomi had lost everything. Naomi thought her life was over. She had nothing to look forward to. But God sent a kinsman redeemer. Do you know in our life, sometimes people go through life, a life and they have nothing to look forward to. Life has beat them up. Life has not been good. But you know, God in his mercy always sends the kinsman redeemer. Now, personally, our kinsman redeemer is the Lord Jesus Christ because he had to purchase us at Calvary. And that's exactly what Boaz did. He had to pay 
to marry Ruth. He had to purchase not only her, but the property. And that's what Jesus did for us. He bought us back. We were, we were in sin. We were away from God. And he purchased us with his precious blood. And he redeemed us. And he bought us back. And now we belong to him. Just like Ruth belonged to, to, uh, to Boaz and the property belonged to Boaz, so it is. We belong to Jesus, our kinsman redeemer. So what a beautiful story of redemption. What a beautiful story of what God does for us. He takes our broken lives, he takes our sinful lives, and through Jesus redeems us and restores our life and gives us a new life in Christ. Well, it has a happy ending, does it not? Well, I'm glad one of these stories has a happy ending. <laughs> and uh, once again, in, in all the terrible stories we read about judges, it, it, was, it was good to see God still alive and working and doing a good work. So let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight for this time to share the story of Ruth. I pray that it was a... Uh, you know, a, an interesting story, and certainly probably most people had heard some of the story, if not all the story, but we see how uh, Jesus, you are our kinsman redeemer. You purchased us at Calvary. You bought our salvation. We thank you for that. Bless now, Father, this, uh, this beautiful story, and may we learn and always be reminded that even when our life gets, gets out of sorts and we may become bitter and we lose family or loved ones, that, Lord, you're still in our midst, and you're still going to work all things together for good, and we thank you for that. So bless now our time together in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, thank you for being here tonight. Those who are watching online, we're going to say goodbye to you, and we're going to go to prayer to, uh, with our folks that are here in our service.